first distinction to make is this. What is that which always is, having no origin and being always identical with itself? Plato. Buddha teaches that all beings are from eternity abiding in nirvana. Das Gupta's History of Indian Philosophy. By God, I understand being absolutely infinite, that is, substance consisting of infinitely numerous attributes, each of which expresses eternal and infinite essence. For if a thing is absolutely infinite, whatsoever expresses any essence belongs to the essence of that thing. Spinoza. The non-existent is infinite. It is eternal. It possesses many attributes in common with God. It includes an infinity of things since all those which never exist belong to the non-existent and those which exist no longer have fallen back into the non-existent. Leibniz Chapter 1 Various Approaches to Essence A modern or romantic man is an adventurer. He is less interested in what there may be to find than in the lure of the search and in his hopes, guesses, or experiences in searching. Essence is perfectly indifferent to being discovered and unaffected by the avenue through which any discoverer may approach it, and for that very reason the explorer ignores it and asks what it can possibly be. Now, the subjective attitude in philosophy is not only prevalent in these times, but always legitimate because a mind capable of self-consciousness is always free to reduce all things to its own view of them. Before considering the realm of essence in itself, therefore I will indicate some paths by which even the most rambling reflection may be led to it. Essence is indeed everywhere at hand, and a scrupulous skepticism, falling back on immediate appearance, is itself a chief means of discovering the pervasive presence of essences. In a volume on skepticism and animal faith, to which the present work is a sequel, I have described in detail the approach to essence through skepticism. Knowledge such as animal life requires is something transitive, a form of belief in things absent or eventual or somehow more than the state of the animal knowing them. It needs to be, otherwise the animal mind would be the prisoner of its dreams, and no better informed than a stone about its environment, its past, or its destiny. It follows that such transitive knowledge will always be open to doubt. It is a claim or presumption arising in a responsive organism. Yet in spite of this biological status, it ventures upon assertions concerning facts elsewhere. This boldness exposes it to all sorts of errors, for opinion will vary with its organ and, on that irrelevant ground, will make varying assertions about its outlying objects. Nor is it to be presumed that initially the terms in which objects are conceived are their intrinsic qualities. The terms may be in quality as an existence generated in the organ of sense, as are words or optical perspectives. Knowledge of nature or of absent experience is accordingly no less questionable in its texture than in its scope. Its validity is only presumptive and its terms are merely symbols. The skeptic once on his set will soon trace essence to its lair. He will drop, as dubious and unwarranted, the belief in the past, an environment, or a destiny. He will dismiss all thought of any truth to be discovered or any mind engaged in that egregious chase. And he will honestly confine himself to noting the features of the passing apparition. 
At first, you may still assume that he can survey the passage and transformation of his dreams. But soon, if he is truly skeptical and candid, he will confess that this alleged order of appearances and this extended experience are themselves only dreamt of, like the future or the remoter past or the material environment, those discarded idols of his dogmatic days. Nothing will remain but some appearance now, and that which appears in all gratuitous implications of a world beyond, or a self here are discarded, will be in essence. Nor will his own spirit, or spirit absolute, which grammar may still seem to insert under the form of the pronoun I, as a prior agent in this intuition of essence, be anything but another name for the absolute phantom, the unmeaning presence into which knowledge will have collapsed. This approach to essence through skepticism is by no means the only one possible. Even for a critic of knowledge, skepticism can impung only such knowledge as is a form of faith and posits a removed object. But the dialectician ignores this sort of knowledge as much as he can, and by his initial attitude plants himself in the realm of essence, and wishes to confine himself to it. What is dialectic? Precisely an analysis or construction of ideal forms which abstracts from such animal faith as might be stimulated by their presence, and traces instead the inherent patterns or logical relations of these forms as intuition reveals them. To the dialectician, animal faith seems wanton and superfluous, and in his overt reasoning, if not in his secret assumption, he neither posits any objects of natural knowledge nor seeks to describe them. Such preoccupation with dark external facts and hidden events seems to him but a groveling instinct. And the persuasion that one's ideas describe natural objects, though inevitable perhaps in sniffing one's way through this nether world, he laughs at as a vain presumption, unworthy of the name of science. In practice, as a man amongst men, the dialectician may have mixed views. If he is an enthusiast or a naturalist in disguise, using dialectic for some ulterior purpose, he will probably embrace his conclusions not merely as implications of his premises, but as objects of hot animal faith he may even think he has discovered a metaphysical world, when in truth he has merely elaborated a system of essences, altogether imaginary, and in no way more deeply rooted in reality than any system of essences which a poet or a musician might compose. This eventual mystification, however, by which dialectic is represented as revealing facts, does not destroy its native confidence to describe essences. In its purity, it will be free from error, because free from any pretense to define ulterior existences. Now this very purity, this identity of the object envisaged with the definition given to it in thought, seems to the dialectician the perfection of science, because it is the last refuge of certitude. But certitude and dialectical cogency are far removed from animal faith, and unnecessary to it. And animal faith, when it describes in suitable symbols, of which a dialectical system may be one, the objects encountered in action, is what I call knowledge. The question of titles and preferences does not concern me here. In any case, the dialectician, whether his art be called knowledge or not, has discovered the realm of essence, or some province in it, and has devoted himself to exploring it. This acquaintance with essence I call intuition, whether it be passive, aesthetic, or mystical, 
or on the contrary analytical and selective as in reasoned discourse because at every point demonstration or inference depends for its force on intuition of the intrinsic relation between the given terms so in planning a series of moves in chess as in originally inventing that game the mind sees the consequences implied at each stage by the rules of procedure these rules are mere essences but their implications are precise in any hypothetical position of the pieces if chess were not a well-established game and if material chess boards and chess men had never existed the daydream in which particular imaginary matches were traced out could hardly be called knowledge but every possibility and every consequence involved at each juncture would be equally definite and the science of chess even if chess never had existed in the world would be an exact science evidently an exact science is not without an object ideal as this object may be indeed the ideal definition of that object the absence of all ambiguity as to what it is renders exact science of it possible such definable non-existent objects of exact science have being in an eminent degree their nature and their eternal intrinsic relations to other comparable natures are perfectly determinate they are what they are and of all the meanings of the word is existence substance equivalence definition etc the most radical and proper is that in which i may say of anything that it is what it is the observation does not commit me to any classification of an object or to any assertion of its existence I really note its idiosyncrasy its qualitative identity which enables me to distinguish it study it and hold it fast in my intent so that I may eventually frame a definition of it and perhaps assert or deny its existence if any object had no such specific character there would be no truth in saying that it was before me or could ever again be the theme of memory or discourse essences by being eternally what they are enable existence to pass from one phase to another and enable the mind to note and describe the change that what i see i see but what I am, I am, may seem a vain assertion. Practical minds are not interested in anything except for the sake of something else. They are camp followers or heralds of events without self-possession. Yet if that which is actual and possessed at the moment never had a satisfying character, no satisfaction would ever be possible. The mind could never dip twice into the same subject or know its friends from its enemies, and life would be what a romantic philosophy would make it, an idle escape from one error into another. Radical flux is indeed characteristic of existence, where it is innocent, since there can be no mistake or regret where there is no purpose. But the mind, even if describing only the series of its own illusions, attempts to describe it with truth and it could not so much as fail in this attempt unless that series of illusions in each of its terms had a precise inexpungible character but then the question whether in some ulterior sense those phases were illusions or not becomes a subsidiary question in any case internally they were what they were and to a simple and recollected spirit the obvious often is enough its identity may have a deep charm like that of a jewel. I may long ruminate upon it and impress it upon myself by repetitions, which to a lover never seem vain. Even in the midst of distractions, if I say to myself, 
No, no. Business is business. Repetition serves to attach and to render indubitable the essence meant. It raises that material accident to the intellectual level, where my judgment henceforth may recognize it to the exclusion of circumstances, which do not alter essences, but only cases. Sometimes sense itself, without any dialectical analysis, distinguishes essences from facts and recognizes them in their ideal sphere. This happens for a very simple reason, stimulus that calls animal attention to some external fact in provoking an act of the body also presents some image to the mind. Moreover, this labor of perception may be more or less welcome, pleasant, or life-enhancing, apart from its ulterior uses. And sometimes this incidental emotion is so strong that it overpowers the interest which I may have had originally in the external facts, and I may suspend my action or continue it automatically while my thought is absorbed in the image or rested there as I was jogging to market in my village cart. Beauty has burst upon me, and the reins have dropped from my hands. I am transported in a certain measure into a state of trance. I see with extraordinary clearness, yet what I see seems strange and wonderful, because I no longer look in order to understand, but only in order to see. I have lost my preoccupation with fact, and I am contemplating an essence. This experience in modern times is called aesthetic, but it has no exclusive connection with the arts or with the beautiful. It is really intellectual, and the high platonic road. But the clearest and purest reality should be formal or ideal, and something on which no animal instinct could possibly be directed may seem a paradox. It may be denied by cynics, often very dull people. It may be used by metaphysicians as an argument for the supernatural origin and destiny of the soul. It is important at once to discard any such inferences not only because they are in themselves mistaken, thin, and superstitious, but particularly at this point in my argument because they encumber the notion of essence with a moral significance quite extraneous to it, and may distort and discredit it altogether. When a thing is beautiful, I stop to look at it, and in this way its beauty helps me to drink in the actual appearance and to be satisfied with that ethereal draught. But if the thing were ugly or uninteresting, it would have an absolute appearance just as much and would present an essence to intuition, only that in that case I should have no motive, no vital animal motive, for dwelling upon that essence or noticing it at all. If the thing is beautiful, this is not because it manifests an essence but because the essence which it manifests is one to which my nature is attuned, so that the intuition of it is a delightful exercise to my senses and to my soul. This pleasure and refreshment welling up in me, I courteously thank the object for it and call its intrinsic charm. But an intrinsic charm is a contradiction in terms and all that the object possesses is affinity to my life and power over it, without which it would be impossible for me to observe it or to think it beautiful. The beautiful is itself an essence, an indefinable quality felt in many things which, however disparate they may be otherwise, receive this name by virtue of a special emotion, half wonder, half love, which is felt in their presence. The essence of the beautiful, when made an object of contemplation by itself, is rather misleading, like the good and like pure being. It requires much dialectical and spiritual training to discern it in its purity and in its fullness. At first, the impetuous philosopher, seeing the world in so many places flowering into beauty, may confuse his physics with a subjective or teleological reference to the beautiful, thereby turning this essence which marks a spiritual consummation into a material power. Or if he is not an enthusiast, 
he may dwell so much on instinctive and pleasant bonds which attach men to what they call beautiful that he may bury the essence of the beautiful altogether under heavy descriptions of the occasions on which perhaps it appears. I will not stop to discuss these complications, however apt to be entangled itself, the beautiful is a great liberator of other essences. The most material thing, in so far as it is felt to be beautiful, is instantly immaterialized, raised above external personal relations, concentrated and deepened in its proper being, in a word, sublimated into an essence. While on the other hand, many unnoticed platonic ideas, relations, or unsubstantial aspects of things, when the thrill of beauty runs through them, are suddenly revealed, as in poetry the secret harmonies of feelings and of words. In this way, innumerable natural themes of happiness, which no one could possibly mistake for themes, become members of the human family, and in turn restore the prodigal mind, perhaps long wasted on facts, to its home circle of essence. This native affinity of the mind to essence rather than to fact is mind itself, the very nature of spirit or intellectual light, the sort of intelligence which adapts one natural being to another and may be found in the conduct of animals or even in the structure of their bodies does not consist in thinking. It is an adaptation of life to its conditions, of a form of behavior in matter which must exist and flourish before thinking or even feeling can arise at all. Intuition would be impossible without an underlying animal life, a psyche, for how should the sheer light of intuition actualize itself, or choose the essence on which it should fall? A psyche the hereditary organization and movement of life in an animal must first exist and sustain itself by its intelligent adaptations to the ambient world. These adaptations are not conscious until, by virtue of their existence, intuition arises. And intuition arises when the inner life of the animal, or its contact with external things, is expressed in some actual appearance, some essence given in feeling or thought. The psyche and the material circumstances, by their special character and movement, determine the choice and succession of themes on which intuition shall be employed in some particular person, and so far as spirit is kindled there at all, it will have raised those themes to the plane of essence, the whole movement of nature and of human affairs, which imposes those themes, becomes itself only another theme for contemplation, if present to the mind at all. This contemplation does not require a man to shut his eyes or to fix them exclusively on the stars. It does not require him to stop living or acting. Often the most contemplative minds are the most worldly wise and the most capable of directing business, but though they may survey or foresee action, they do not live in action because they see it in its wholeness and in its results. As a spectator who sees the plot of a play understands the emotions of the characters, but does not succumb to them, or as a writer, very busy with his pen and conveying much ink from inkstand to paper, may be thinking of his subject, and the words will probably come most aptly when, as words, they come unconsciously, and when the truth which they express absorbs the whole mind. The same thing happens in a game of ball, or in a game of politics when the player is good, the quick adjustment of his faculties and organs being automatic kindles in his mind a graphic image and a pure emotion to be the signs of his achievement to his inner man. The natural and the spiritual fruits of life are not opposed, but they are different. Its natural fruits are more life, persisting through readjustments and an incessant generation of new forms so that youth may fill the place of age and attain an equal, though not identical, perfection. It is in these perfections, or in approaches which partly anticipate them, that the spiritual fruits are found. As we have seen, they may ripen early, 
and may be gathered at all seasons when any phase of life is perfected in action, but the spiritual fruits are internal and tangential to this action, not consequent upon it, like the natural fruits. They may be omnipresent in existence, but only by everywhere transmuting existence into essence. Spirit is life looking out of the window. The work of the household must have been done first, and is best done by machinery. Moral triumphs are not aesthetic, because they have other occasions, but they are equally intellectual when realized in the spirit. They lie in the joy of having done this. They are a passage into essence. Finality, though it is not felt as beauty, marks the great moments of passion satisfied or purposes achieved. Into some scene, into some phrase, into some gesture in itself trivial, the whole burden of a long experience may then be cast, and happiness may be centered and realized in some simple event or in some silent moment. I should need but to enlarge this canvas in order to paint the whole happiness possible to man. And what should it lie? And going on, and simply not stopping, and passing into some better experience? But in what would it be better? In being fuller or longer? I think the longer and the fuller a bad life is, the worse it is. How then should it be made better? Only, surely, by bringing all its activities, as far as possible, to intrinsic perfection and mutual harmony, so that at each step, in every high moment of synthesis and reflection, intuition may fall on an essence beyond which it need not look, finding in it peace, liberation, and a sufficient token that fate, so far as that expression of spirit is concerned, has lost its terrors. Without such vision realized at each of its stages, life would be a mere fatality, automatism at odds with itself, procession of failures. Spirit would have been called into being by a false promise. Its only hope would be that by sleep supervening, or by distraction so extreme as to destroy the organic harmonies on which intuition depends, that mistake should be corrected and forgotten. This possible conflict between matter and spirit is a family quarrel. It is not a shock between independent forces brought together by accident, since spirit cannot exist except in matter, and matter cannot become interested in its formations and fortunes save by creating a spirit that may observe and celebrate them. How happily spirit and matter may lead their common Life together appears in play at the beginning, and in contemplation at the end, it is only in the middle when animal faculties are inwardly perfect and keen enough to be conscious, but are outwardly ill-adjusted and ignorant, that trouble arises, because the mind sees and wants one thing, and circumstances impose something different, requiring disposition and a form of imagination in the animal to which his play life is not adapted. Spirit, the voice of the inner nature in so far as it is already formed and definite, accordingly suffers continual defeats by the defeat of those animal impulses which it expresses, and if these impulses become confused or exhausted, it sinks with them into vice or discouragement. It would soon perish altogether and annul the moral problem which its existence creates unless in some way a harmony could be re-established between the individual and the world. This may be done in society at large by some firm political and moral regimen, or it may be done religiously by the discipline of the inner man, so that a part of him is weaned from the passions and interests which distract the world, and is centered upon purely intellectual or spiritual aspiration. Religion is hard for external events to defeat, since ill fortune stimulates it as much at least as good fortune. Thus, within strict limits and in a sober garb, the play life of childhood is restored to the soul. Hence, that happy quarrel of philosophers, happy because both parties are right, as to whether wisdom is a meditation on life or on death. But in the midst of one, we are in the other, 
not only in that existence is transition, but far more remarkably in that life triumphant is life transmuted into something which is not life, into union with essence, with so much of the eternal as is then manifested in the transitory. This manifestation, with all the approaches to it, is life itself, and death is the fading of that vision, the passing of that essence back into its native heaven, depriving us by its obscuration of a part of ourselves, so that existence in us must lapse into some different phase, or into total darkness. Life, if by this word we understand the process of mutation, is itself death, to be fed is to kill, to advance is to reject and abandon. The truly creative movement is only upward, and life, insofar as it means light and accomplishment, is only some predestined intuition achieved, some wish for essence made manifest. Existence itself is a momentary victory of essence, a victory over matter in that matter, which might have taken any other form, takes this particular one and keeps circling about it, as if fascinated. Not that there is really any magic here, but that matter, which has to have some form or other, is willing enough to be true to the one it has, and so indifferent is it to form, to renounce for an indefinite time its native right to inconstancy. To renounce for an indefinite time its native right to inconstancy, as a hardened traveler, not caring what inn he stays at, may remain good-naturedly at the one in which he happens to be lodged. Essence is victorious also over spirit, and no less amiably victorious, since it is an essence that spirit aspires to lose itself and to find its quietus, as it was from essence that matter managed to borrow some character and some beauty. What Spinoza meant by meditation on life was, I take it, the effort to wrest the truth of nature out of empirical confusion, so that all the vicissitudes of things might appear under the form of eternity. And what Socrates and Plato meant by meditation on death was almost the same thing. Only the Greeks, by distinguishing many gods and many divine ideas, could humanize and make friends with at least some of them. And in sympathy with those beautiful immortals, they could survey and dismiss earthly existence with a touch of disdain. Whereas the piety of thrifty, immortalizing nations, when enlightened, is used only in a scrupulous natural philosophy. Being overawed by the facts and eager for existence and prosperity, they miss the liberal life. They prefer perpetual servitude if well fed to emancipation, such as interest and pure essences affords. And often, though not in Spinoza, they substitute a troubled hope in some fabulous resurrection for the present union with the eternal which is natural to spirit. Thus, skepticism, dialectic, contemplation, and spiritual discipline all lead to the discrimination of essence. Anyone who has trodden any of these paths to the end will not need to be told what essence means, or that it is a most real and interesting realm of being. But it is not the whole of being. On the contrary, were there nothing but essence, not one of these approaches to it would be open. There would be no possible movement, no events, no life, and no preference. Considered in itself, essence is certainly the deepest, the only inevitable form of reality. But I am here speaking of approaches to it, that is, of considerations drawn from human experience that may enable us to discern that primary reality and to recognize it to be such in contrast to our own form of being. We stand then on another plane, the plane of scattered experience, brute fact, contingent existence. If we did not, the discernment of essence would have no novelty for us. It would reveal no night firmament behind our day. It would not liberate us from ourselves or from the incubus of accidental things. If we were prompted then 
by our new insight to cry that our old life was all illusion. We might be turning this insight into a new folly. Enlightenment itself would be impossible if chance experiences had not proceeded, perfectly real in their own way. Indeed, existence, something that has no foothold whatever in the realm of essence, is presupposed and contained in any assertion or denial, and in the intuition of essence itself. The existence and distribution of enlightenment, as of any other fact, places us to begin with in another realm, the realm of matter, which must be begged separately. Without it, there could be no manifestation of essence, whether in nature or in discourse. The priority of the realm of essence is therefore not temporal or dynamic. It is an infinite fuel for its selection. Evidently, it cannot select or emphasize any part of itself. When this selection takes place, we accordingly refer it to a different principle, which we may call chance. Fact or matter. But this principle would be a mere word, a term without indicative force. If it did not select some feature of the realm of essence to be its chosen form, in other words, if this brute accident were not some accident in particular, contrasted with the infinity of other forms which it has not chosen, to appeal to fact, thump existence with empirical conviction is accordingly but to emphasize some essence, like the virtuous bridegroom renouncing all others. The exclusion is opportune, but the bride, after all, is only one of a million, and the mind has simply wedded in essence. The principle of constancy, or perhaps of inconstancy, the selective principle, is matter. Yet, whatever way it may turn, it must embrace one essence or another. The approaches to essence are, therefore, as various as those predispositions in matter which determine the poses of life. Or we may say that for the mind there is a single avenue to essence namely, attention. Awaken attention, intensify it, purify it into white flame, and the actual and unsubstantial object of intuition will stand before you in all its living immediacy and innocent nakedness. But notice, this attention, discovering nothing but essence, is itself an animal faculty. It is called forth by a material stress or by passion. Passions, insofar as they are impulses to action, entangle us materially in the flux of substance. Being intent on seizing, transforming, or destroying something that exists, but at the same time, insofar as they quicken the mind, they are favorable to the discernment of essence. And it is only a passionate soul that can be truly contemplative. The reward of the lover which also chastens him, is to discover that in thinking he loved anything of this world, he was profoundly mistaken. Everybody strives for possession, that is the animal instinct on which everything hangs. But possession leaves the true lover unsatisfied. His joy is in the character of the thing loved, and the essence it reveals, whether it be here or there, now or then, his or another's. This essence, which for action was only a signal letting loose a generic animal impulse, the contemplation is the whole object of love, and the sole gain in loving. Naturally, essences seem thin abstractions to those absorbed in action, whose heart is set on the eventual, and to whom the actual is never anything. The actual in experience is never more than an echo or supplement to deeper facts. A shimmer on the surface of the great sea laboring beneath. Yet the actual in experience is never an abstraction from experience itself. It is the whole fruit of that hidden labor. The entire reality for the spirit it is therefore not as quality attributed to external things that essence is best distinguished. For the color or the shape of an apple may be supposed to exist in it and when drawn out and imagined existing alone they may seem ghostly. Neither the roundness nor the redness of the apple would be edible. 
puberty child that would be miserable cheats, but not so to the painter or the geometer. The child might be better initiated into the nature of essence, which is not far from the innocent mind. If he chose an instant the pleasure of eating the apple or of snatching it from another boy's hand, essences which he would distinguish easily from their opposites, and which he would not be tempted to incorporate into apples. A little experience would convince him that these intangible pleasures gave importance to apples, and not apples to them. And he would join the painter of still life and the geometer in finding that things are mere instruments, and that only essences are essential. Interest in marking the differences in precise characters of things which are all that the mind can take from them, is the great revealer of essence. Herein appears the thoroughly intellectual or, po po or poetical virtue of spirit. The more intense and dominating it is, the less it dwells on the machinery which may control its existence, and the more exclusively it addresses itself to the true or the beautiful, that is, the essences which experience would manifest if it were pure and perfect. Chapter 2 The Being Proper to Essences The principle of essence we have seen is identity. The being of each essence is entirely exhausted by its definition. I do not mean its definition in words, but the character which distinguishes it from any other essence. Every essence is perfectly individual. There can be no question in the realm of essence of mistaken identity, vagueness, shiftiness, or self-contradiction. These doubts arise in respect to natural existences or the meanings or purposes of living minds, but in every doubt or equivocation both alternatives are genuine essences, and in groping and making up my mind, I merely hesitate between essences, not knowing on which to rest my attention. There is no possibility of flux or ambiguity within any of the alternatives which might be chosen at each step. This inalienable individuality of each essence renders it a universal for being perfectly self-contained and real only by virtue of its intrinsic character, it contains no reference to any setting in space or time, and stands in no adventitious relations to anything. Therefore, without forfeiting its absolute identity, it may be repeated or reviewed any number of times. Such embodiments or views of it, like the copies of a book or the acts of reading it, will be facts or events in nature, which is a net of external relations, but the copies would not be copies of the same book, nor the readings readings of it, unless, and insofar as, the same essence reappeared in them all. Physical obstacles to exact repetitions or reproductions do not affect the essential universality of every essence. Even if by chance it occurs only once or never occurs at all, because in virtue of its perfect identity and individuality, it cannot fall out of the catalog of essences where it fills its particular place. If I try to delete it, I reinstate it, since in deleting that I have recognized and defined it anew, bearing witness to its possessing the whole being which it can claim as an essence. There, accordingly, it stands, waiting to be embodied or noticed, if nature or attention ever chose to halt at that point or to traverse it. Every essence in its own realm is just as central, just as normal, and just as complete as any other. It is therefore always just as open to exemplification or to thought, without the addition or subtraction of one iota of its being. Time and space may claim and repeat it as often or as seldom as they will. That is their own affair. The flux is free to have as much plasticity as it has and to miss all that it misses. And it is free to be as monotonous 
as it likes, if it finds it easier to fall again and again into the same form, rather than to run away into perpetual and unreturning novelties. The realm of essence is the scale of measurement, the continuum of variation, on which these repetitions or these novelties may be plotted and compared. Re-embodiments or re-surveys of an essence, if they occur, bind the parts of the flux together ideally and render it amenable to description. The central universality of these forms makes any fact, insofar as it exhibits them, distinct and knowable. The universal and the individual being so far from contrary that they are identical. I am not myself unless I reenact now the essence of myself, which I may reenact at all times and places. Since essences are universals not needing to figure in any particular place or time, but fit to figure in any, it is not possible to investigate the realm of essence by empirical exploration. You cannot go in search of that which is nowhere. Some essences will appear or occur to you, since whatever intuition life may awaken in you must light up some essence or other. But what further essences, if any, there may be is not discoverable by simply waiting for them to turn up. Nature is indeed very rich in forms, compared with the inertia and monotony of experience in home-keeping animals, revolving in their private circle of habits and ideas. But nature, too, is built on a single plan. All nuclei and planets, all life and death, and as much a slave of routine as any of her creatures. The unexemplified is not exemplified there, the unthought of is not thought of, not because in itself it resists being created or described, but because nature and thought happen not to bloom in any way but that in which they have taken to blooming. In part, indeed, this restriction may be due to local prejudice and ignorance in the observer who draws the periphery of nature with his compass. Another man, a different animal, a spirit native to another world, may even now be greeting the essences which it has not entered into my heart to conceive. Evidently, my limitations cannot forbid them to rejoice in their different experience, nor can the limitations of any actual experience forbid the essences it leaves out to be just those which are absent. An essence is an inert theme, something which cannot bring itself forward, but must be chosen, if chosen, by some external agent. And evidently the choice made by this agent, contingent as it is and wholly arbitrary, cannot render unavailable the other inert themes which other agents or itself in a different moment of its flux might choose instead. The very contingency of existence, the very blindness of life, throw the doors wide open towards the infinity of being. Even if some philosopher or some god thought himself omniscient, surprises might be in store for him, and thoughts new to his thought, nay, even supposing that his whole experience and the entire history of his world lay synthesized before him under the form of eternity, and that he was not a victim of sheer egotism in asserting that nothing more could ever exist. Still, the wanton idiosyncrasy of that total fact, the enormity of that accident, cannot be blustered away. Existence is irrational for a deeper and more intrinsic reason than because one part of it may not be deducible from another. Any part and all its parts together are irrational in merely existing and in being otherwise than as essences are, that is, identical with themselves and endowed with that formal being which it is impossible that anything, whatever it be, should not possess. Not that essence can resist or resent this irrational selection which existence makes of its riches. On the contrary, essence is a sort of invitation to the dance. 
It tempts nature with openings in every direction, and in so doing it manifests its own inexhaustible variety. Its very being is to set no limits to the forms of being. The multitude of essences is absolutely infinite. This assertion has an audacious sound, and I should not venture upon it had it not a counterpart or corollary which takes away all its venom, namely that essences do not exist. If I were in pursuit of substance, as I shall be in the second book, I should distrust any description of it not purely tentative, empirical, and scrupulously modest. But the bold definition which Spinoza gives of what he calls substance, that it is being absolutely infinite, seems to me a perfect and self-justifying definition of the realm of essence. Because in conceiving and defining such an object, we prove it to possess the only being which we mean to ascribe to it, denying it to be infinite, or denying that any supposed element in it existed, we should be designating these missing elements in that absent infinity, whereby we should be instituting them ideally and recognizing them to be essences. The realm of essence is comparable to an infinite Quran, or the logos that was in the beginning, written in invisible but indelible ink, prophesizing all that being could ever be or contain. And the flux of existence is the magical reagent, traveling over it in a thin stream like a reader's eye, and bringing here one snatch of it and there another to the light for a passing moment. Each reader may be satisfied with his own verse and think it the whole of scripture, but the mere assertion of this limit or suspicion that other readers might find other texts is enough to show that the non-existent cannot be limited since the limits of the existent might always be changed. To deny the being of essence, because it may happen to be unrealized, is self-contradictory, for if it is not realized, it must have a quality, distinguishing it from realized forms. Unrealized forms may not interest a sluggish mind, and a arithmetician who was happy in the thought of whole numbers might deprecate all mention of vulgar fractions or repeating decimals, and might swear to die without them, lest his safe and honest arithmetic should be complicated with unrealities. But unrealities of that sort nevertheless envelop his realities on every side, and it is his arrest at his realities that, if you like, is unreal. There is no reason in it, and no permanence, whereas the unrealities are unchangeable, inevitable, and always standing behind the door. Even if the whole realm of essence, as Spinoza assumed, realized somewhere at some time in the life of nature, essence would remain a different and a non-existent realm, because the realization of each part could be only local and temporary, and for all the rest of time and all the worlds that excluded it, each fact would fade into the corresponding essence, and would remain certain and inevitable as an essence only, and as a fact merely presumptive. Essence so understood much more truly is than any substance or any experience or any event, for a substance, event, or experience may change its form or may exist only by changing it, so that all sorts of things that are proper to it in one phase will be absent from it in another. It will not be a unit at all, save by external delimitation, perhaps some abstract constancy in quantity, energy, or continuity may be discovered to run through it, but this constant element will never be the actual experience, event, or substance in its living totality at any moment, or perhaps all the phases of such an existence may be viewed together and synthesized into one historical picture. But this picture would again not be the existent substance, experience, or event unrolling itself in act. It would be only a description of that portion of the flux seen under the form of eternity. In other words, it would be an essence and not an existence. Essence is just that character which any existence wears insofar as it remains identical with itself and so long as it does so. The very character which 
it throws overboard by changing and loses altogether when it becomes something else. To be able to become something else, to suffer change and yet endure is the privilege of existence, be it in a substance, an event, or an experience, whereas essences can be exchanged but not changed. Existence at every step casts off one essence and picks up another. We call it the same existence when we are able to trace its continuity and change, by virtue of its locus and proportions, but often we are constrained to give up the count and to speak of a new event, a new thing. The essences or forms traverse a mutation render this mutation possible and describable, without their eternal distinctness. No part of the flux could differ in any respect from any other part, and the whole would collapse into a lump without order or quality. So much more profound is the eternal being of the essences traversed in change than that of the matter or attention or discourse which plays with those essences at touch and go. Another thing then more truly is than character. Without this wedding garment, no guest is admitted to the feast of existence, whereas the unbidden essences do not require that invitation, with which very little characters are sometimes honored, in order to preserve their proud identity out in the cold. There those few privileged revelers will soon have to rejoin them, not a whit fatter for their being surfeit of being. After things lose their existence, as before they attain it, although it is true of them that they have existed or will exist, they have no internal being except their essences, quite as if they had never broached existence at all. Yet the identity of each essence with itself and difference from every other essence suffices to distinguish and define them all in eternity, where they form the realm of essence. True and false assertions may be made about any one of them, such, for instance, as that it does not exist, or that it includes or excludes some other essence, or is included or excluded by it. Here is a further character inseparable from essence. All essences are eternal. No hyperbole or rhetorical aflatus is contained in this assertion, as if some prophet pronounce some law or some city to be everlasting, that any existing thing should be everlasting, though not impossible, is incongruous with the contingency of existence. God or matter, if they are everlasting, are so by a sort of iterated contingency and perpetual reproduction, for it is in the nature of existence to be here and perhaps not there, now and perhaps not then. It must be explored to discover how far it may stretch. It must wait and see how long it shall last. The assumption that it lasts or stretches forever can be made only impetuously by animal enthusiasm, when the feeling of readiness and omnipotence makes some living creature defy all threats of disaster. Yet so long as we live in time, the ghost of the murdered past will always fill the present with a profound uneasiness. If the eternity of essence were conceived after that fashion, it would indeed be a rash boast. No essence has an essential lean on existence anywhere, much less everywhere and always. This eternity has nothing to do with such mortal hazards. It is merely the self-identity proper to each of the forms which existence may put on or off, illustrate somewhere, or perhaps illustrate always, or very likely never illustrate at all. The realm of essence, like the Empyrean, is a clear and tranquil region when you once reach it, but for the observer from the earth clouds may intervene, or his eye may be arrested at some nearer sphere which, just because it has some opaqueness, may think the true blue. Instead of conceiving essences, he may conceive possible beings, problematical facts, forms of things, abstractions, thoughts, sensations, or natural elements. Of course, such intermediate objects, however they be defined, will exhibit some essence, since some essence cannot help appearing in any chosen thing whatsoever. 
but in the categories just mentioned, there is some ambiguity, some reference to contingent existence, which limits their scope and renders them altogether confusing if taken as synonyms for essential being. The word possible is slippery and treacherous. It is commonly applied to anything that the speaker can readily imagine, especially when he is ignorant whether it is a fact or not. In this sense, the whole future and much of the past is called possible when imaginable, but in another sense, the whole past and future, even when unimaginable, must have been possible too. The materially possible threatens to coincide with the actual course of nature, and then the term possible begins to mean the materially impossible, provided it is imaginable. The imagination, however, is itself something existent and extremely elastic. A little shake or a new stimulus will cause it to conceive many new possibilities. Then these have been impossibilities before? Perhaps we may take refuge in the notion that everything is possible except what is self-contradictory. In other words, things are not possible merely because they are actual, or merely because they are imagined, but if they are such as not to preclude being imagined. But how should anything preclude being imagined? If an imagination arose capable of imagining it. The meaning can only be that my own imagination, in some particular instance, and that in speaking of the round square or of the son of a barren woman, I have lost the meaning of my terms, and what I call an impossibility is only the suspense of my thought between two possibilities. Nothing contradicts itself, not even this state of confusion in my thinking. It is a perfectly possible muddle. This process of fluctuating from one object to another has a character easily recognizable. Its essence, like every essence, is individual, and the sense it may reappear is universal. Contradiction is a vice into which discourse may fall when it blurs the inherent distinctness of different essences. Determination, individuality, variety, infinitely precise and indelible degrees of articulation being themselves all equally distinct is the very being of essence. 